Well, Ashley, I am interested in in threads and you do such a good job in your book of continuing the threads of your story of the things that happen and you know in this story looking at motives i'm always curious i think more and more in the childhood things and seeing how they came up and you talk about graduating kindergarten and you wanted to be a, a mother and an author and, and a poet but i was also just an amateur even with the boldness that you had just to stand up in a crowd and, and talk about that and was that something just innate in your own nature or it's always a nature versus nurture question did you have parents who were very outspoken and willing to say what they did in a public forum and you kind of gotten some exposure to that or is this just you yeah i grew up as an first of all thanks for having me i'm so excited Absolutely. for this conversation you're so much fun already to just talk to and i think this conversation requires such a great interviewer to talk about motives and as far as my own go, I was an anomaly in my family. Both of my parents worked in real estate. My brother, my little brother has grown up to also work in real estate. Oh. So they always, my whole family was always riding the highs and the lows of the housing market. And it's not to say that that created total instability in my household, but it made me feel a lot to watch the feast or famine. Like, oh. you know, sometimes my dad was selling homes like crazy. He worked in commercial real estate. He had so many deals going and things were super easy, but there were also times where things were really hard. And before that, he had a large company that he had lost. He had a financial firm. And so for me, I remember my dad as a kid, he said to me, you know, you have two choices in life. You can either go on a merry-go-round and he was referring to a salary job or you can be on a roller coaster. And he was referring to his own experience of entrepreneurship. And I remember being a kid and thinking like, both of those sound scary. And I just grew up with a lot of feelings. And I think that poetry books and writing was a natural place for me to go to understand my feelings. And I think a lot of people grow up in their families and they don't necessarily relate to where everybody's at and they just feel more or see more or they're more of an empath and they yeah. don't know how to connect because they feel so much. And that was certainly me. How did you view the feast or famine? Yeah, that I think really impacted me. And I think it impacts a lot of people. So, you know, when I was, I want to say six, seven years old, my dad was forced. He was a really hardworking guy. He dropped out of UCLA and this was before he went into real estate. He started a financial firm for municipal bonds and it was the biggest firm west of the Mississippi for what he was doing. And he grew it to 300, 400 employees in Century City. And he was so proud of it. And there was a lot of ease there. And suddenly everything shifted. The market changed. And he had to make that really hard decision to close the doors on his business and nearly claim bankruptcy. And we moved to suburbia. And I remember not really caring about the move because I actually liked that we were moving into a smaller house. We lived in kind of a mansion when I was a little kid and moving into a smaller house. I was really excited because their room was closer to my room and my room was closer to my little brother's room. And it's so funny to think about the lens through which we see the world as little kids. That's what and I was asking. That, that's what I was fishing for there because I grew up in an entrepreneurial home. I, I never knew anything but feast or famine. You know, one year we're driving the new Cadillac Eldorado or whatever it was. And the next, next year, year you're selling it. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's some embarrassing jalopy that I'm being taken to school in, but I just didn't, uh, I looking now as an entrepreneur, you know, to, to what you wrote the book about being open to career tangents and business opportunities. Man, that's, that's all I know. It was easy coming yeah. from feast or famine. I, I realized feast famine, you still, at the end of the day, we didn't die. We didn't end up in the gutter. And I, and so it was a good thing for me, but I know it's not always for everyone. So when you said the word feast or famine, I'm wondering, yeah, how did you perceive that? How did it equip you for now? Yeah. There's this moment that I wrote about in my book. And I think everybody has a moment with money in their life where it suddenly forms what they believe about money and opportunities I, I yeah. yeah, and success. And you know, there's this moment that you read where I remember it was my 10th birthday. My aunt always got me the best gifts. She is one of those gift givers. And even to this day, I'm 33 years old and I can count on her on Christmas that she has deeply thought about who I am, where I'm at and what I won't gift myself that I would want. 
And that was no exception. When I was 10, she got me like this massive gift of coloring, you know, markers and crayons and all of these fun things. And the artist in me felt so seen. And I think that's the thing about birthday gifts is that there's this subtext, I think, with gifts in our society that people don't always realize is there, where a lot of the time a gift feels like a barometer for how much somebody might understand you. Like sometimes if you get a gift and it's so out there, it's like this confusing mix of emotions where you want to be grateful, you want to be appreciative, and you don't know how to manage your face because if it's really weird, you don't want to appear you know, rude. And so- for me, my aunt just always was such a joy. And my dad, you know, I was, he was always very elaborate with his gifts over the top. And one time he got me a horse off of a carousel, cell, like a large life-size rocking horse for my bedroom. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if this is what my aunt got me, I remember thinking, what has my dad got me? And he got me red, yellow, and blue luggage. And I remember seeing the box and thinking, well, maybe whatever I'm seeing on the box isn't what he's giving me. And that ended up being what he was giving me. And at 10 years old, I was like very girly and was like, why do I want this weird colored luggage? And I threw a complete tantrum. I threw it on the floor, lost my mind. And my dad went down with me. He started, he broke down crying. And for the first time I knew what money was because he said, we don't have money to get you anything else. This is the best we can do. And I remember thinking money, like what does money have to do with my birthday gift? And he went to his room and he started having what now I would know as an adult is a panic attack. And my mom was like, you know, I went to my room and was crying. And she said to me, like, you need to go apologize to your dad and be grateful for this gift. And I went to his room and I looked at him and he was breathing weird. And in my little kid head, I'm thinking like, is he okay? Or what's wrong? And I started getting really scared. Dream for my mom to come in. And he, he made some words out. He said, this is going to kill me. And I said, what's going to kill you dad. And he said money. And I think he was just kind of talking to himself, you know, and trying to breathe. And it was in that moment that I deeply believed that if you don't have money, you don't have fun. And who you are in the world only matters if you have money and the pursuit of money, which is kind of an opposite belief is going to kill you. So on one side, I I had a lot of duplicity on one side. It was, I need this thing. And then on the other side, it was, but if I get it, I'm going to die. And I really believe that for a lot of years. And, you know, even just with my dad, watching him struggle, uh, there was always this weight in my heart that money would take him away. And so when I grew up, went to college, I worked hard. I believed that. And and there was another thought I had in that moment was that I could save everyone, that I could bear the brunt, that I'm young, I've got energy. One day I'm going to be rich and I'm going to fix this for everybody. And I pursued that as an adult. I got out of college. I worked super hard and created an online business. And I repeated my dad's exact blueprint. I made a lot of money and right at the height of my success, I lost it all. I made some decisions. I was in my mid twenties. Ashley, I I pulled out the quote uh, because you said your quote there, I'm going to make a lot of money so that life is easy and I can save my dad from dying. Yeah. I thought, yeah. And you talked about, cause then in the book, you talk about the money mindset. Well, that caught me because that is a fairly decent part of my upcoming book is the, the hidden motive I didn't realize. So you, yeah. you voiced it at that point. I had some things happen with business and money and made some decisions I wasn't aware of or, or, or agreed with some things I wasn't aware of that haunted me for decades in businesses. And you see this this, uh, t- take a business, start it, it would succeed and I'd kill it. Take a business over and over and you go, why? And it was some baggage I had around money. I wanted to prove to people I was not about money. I was about heart. I was about yeah. care. And so I ran the businesses like ministries and with yeah. intent and shoving down people's throat what they needed. And of course we know the, you know, the age old uh, beacon of marketing, give them what they want so you can give them what they need. And I was going to pound down anyways. So that when you talk about the money mindset and you saying that at a young age, I'm going to make a lot of money. So that life is easy and I can save my dad from dying. That's a, that's a motive right there. 
Yeah. I think a lot of people have this kind of, like I was saying, this subtext running inside of them around Mm -hmm. money and why they do what they do, why they push extra hard, or in your case, why they don't, you know, like maybe if you were focused on generosity, that would take you away from your business or it put you in your business and just made you a free business. Um, but all of that said, I think everyone does, like you're saying, have these motives. And um, I really operated out of a place of brokenness and fear. And one thing I write about a lot in my book is this concept of fear versus inspiration and how we're all these cars just driving around the world as our bodies and we can fill our gas tanks up with fear. It's pretty effective. You know, you can go pretty far with fear. It's a, it's a mechanism and it's, it's, it's a very real cellular response that will activate chemicals in your body to perform. I was going to say the person who performs yeah. to prove somebody wrong or out of revenge or whatever, it can be good. I wouldn't say overall, but it can, it can be effective as you said. It can be effective and, you know, they're probably going to look the same on the outside as the person who's totally inspired, maybe, maybe not as far as getting results, but it kills you when you're just motivated by so much panic and fear and stress. And in a world that we're living in right now, where 80% of chronic illness comes from stress, it's like an inflammation. Why, why would we choose to, to trade our aliveness? Yeah for these goals. And, you know, one of the biggest things I've realized in retrospect is like, these goals are just feelings that we want to have. And sometimes we think we're going to feel a certain way through getting the goal. And then we get the goal. We don't feel that way. And I think that's why people like Britney Spears are shaving their head, you know, and losing their minds for a period of time, because it's like these, you see so many celebrities reaching the height of their success and completely losing it. And I, I do think it's because they told themselves, like all of us, like this goal is going to make me feel this way and I'm going to give everything to it. And then 20 years later, it's like you look in the mirror and w- what happened? I'm going to quote you again because I wrote that down. Uh, mm-hmm. You said goals are just something we chase because of how we think they'll make us feel when we reach them. I love that statement. I was I was sitting at the table and I stopped and, and pondered that with my focus on motives and what we say that we want. That's why I want people to back up and go, yeah, but why? Why do you want that? And so often we can find out that that want is not true or it's, or we're seeing it in one dimension and it can be achieved elsewhere. So I, I'm going to keep that quote from you. Um, Actually, I'd love to use that as a meme to promote the show possibly. So yeah, um, I'd be honored to, to, and I, I think it's important because the more I can help people tune into where I believe there is an illusion, and this is just my own work, having coached thousands of people in courses and reading my book after 10 years of research, it's like a lot of the time we are chasing an illusion. And that's why there's so much depression. The suicide rate is higher than ever, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And I do know that we're living in really unprecedented times. And yet I think there's nothing quite like sitting at home and being forced not to go anywhere that forces a lot of us to have to think about where we are and how we feel. We have to feel how we feel sitting in the house and being busy is a great way to not feel how we feel. And so I think this past year has gotten a lot of people in touch with these bigger questions of what am I working for? And I think a lot of the times the answers is in these moments, like what we're talking about with my dad. And and it sounds weird for a lot of people to realize like, wow, I'm really working hard because of that weird moment with my dad at age 12 or seven, where I believed this thing and I've been operating out of that. And that's why whenever you believe something new about the world. Like when I really stop believing that my career makes me worthy, that fun is tied to money. I really don't believe that anymore. I think I'm going to have fun money or not. Like I'm going to have a great time. And when I stop believing that it's like an old version of me died because I am seeing the world through such new eyes. And that would be my wish for anyone is to truly see the world through a cleaner windshield so that they can stop making decisions out of trauma and and start allowing themselves to choose a career path, a life, and a partner that is truly based on their heart. Well, and that's why you're on the show, uh, because you hit so many of the threads of motive that I care about for myself or other people to understand what we are consciously or, or subconsciously often doing. And yeah, that we can have an entire trajectory of life uh, much less a career based on something that was not a, a healthy 
choice was not a, a clear direction that we wanted to go. But from it, you even mentioned the word trauma. And so I'm going to take that up because it was actually early this morning, Ashley, that I read about you going to therapy and uh, it being brought back up this one incident yeah. of uh, being molested. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be candid, it stuck out to me because uh, that's my wife's story as well. Very mm -hmm. similar in, in that. And it being just mind blowing how much that can influence your life. And so you found out about that, what, a decade and a half or you're in therapy so yeah. much later after it happened and brought to understand how that became a, well, again, a, a motive, an unknown, I'm going to call it a hidden motive, something yeah. back here that's influencing what you're going to do that you just did not connect at all. And I think that's all of us to some degree, but maybe more so with those who have undergone a trauma to that. To that I, death. I love that you're bringing this up because I feel like it's, it's a touchy subject in a lot of podcast host eyes to bring up that chapter, mm -hmm. but I, for me, I feel so proud to have written about it because I know that there's so many, especially women, unfortunately, yeah. who have been molested and they don't even realize what that's doing for their career and their relationships. So I remember going to therapy to figure out my career path because I was having a total quarter life crisis, like a lot of people do or midlife crisis. And sitting there and saying like, I really want to matter. I want my career to mean something. And she had me close my eyes and say, well, when's the first time that, you know, you felt like you didn't matter or, you know, where did, when's the first time you felt anxiety? Cause I was telling her, I have this anxiety that's like living in me and she was pointing it out. And it went back to this memory of being molested. And, and here's why this matters for anybody listening. If your partner has been molested, if you have what happens is a, you get trust issues potentially. Like, um, if it's a gender thing and it's the opposite gender, usually you're not going to, that's a, that's a huge rupture at a young age when your beliefs about the world are forming. Um, you get confusion with your body, you feel, and, and, and it's trauma to the point where, um, so that memory, that occurrence was blocked from my memory for 10 years. I didn't remember it till I was 17 or 18 in a bad dream. The entire memory came up vividly. And for about three to four years, I was confused on whether it happened or not. And I felt guilty because I would see this person, um, every now and again, and, you know, cause he was just, you know, somebody in like family friend, somebody in our lives. And when I would see him, I would feel these confused mixed emotions. And I didn't know why I was so angry. It was so blocked in my brain. And that's how crazy trauma can be that I didn't know that happened to me until that memory came up. And then I felt guilty. I had a bad dream and that I was judging this person off of a bad dream. And it wasn't until I got really courageous in college that I sat him down and said, did this happen? And he apologized profusely. And it was a moment for me when he apologized where I had a breakdown because I didn't even know if that actually happened to me. And I felt this guilt that I was judging someone for doing something that felt so horrible. And to see him as a human apologizing from a really sincere place, it started my own healing. And my thing is that the anxiety that came into my life from that, from that event, every time I would see that family friend I would get anxiety. I would, and I didn't know why. Right. And I would just carry that with me on an ongoing basis. Cause I would see that family friend, maybe once every couple months, whatever have you. And cause the family would get together, we would see them, whatever. And it was, it was just this ball of nerves and unsafety inside of me and, and, and not knowing why not knowing how to ask for help. And so that came with me into my life. And it turned me into someone who hardened because I would say to myself, like, I am never counting on a man. I had total man issues to be there for me. I'm not going to count on them to make money for me. I, I'm on my own. Like I'm going to make this life happen all by myself. I was in so much fear and, and it's the combination of being molested, not trusting men, um, you know, and even my dad, I trusted my dad. He was such a good dad, but he had a lot of anxiety in his career. So I also didn't trust him to create stability. So even though he was an amazing person, and this is the thing that I would want for a lot of people to realize is everybody comes into the world with a certain thermostat from their caretakers. They set our thermostats because we kind of ride with them. We ride with how they're rolling in the world. And 
unless we question that thermostat, that's just how we show up in the world. And so with my dad, it was feast or famine, like we were talking about. And that for me as a kid, having those trust issues from being molested and feeling scared all the time, watching my dad be afraid, what I really needed to hear as a kid and what I've been able to provide myself as an adult is I've got your back. You never have to worry. You're always going to be okay. And that I do believe that's true. And my dad did the best he could. He was an incredible father. He worked hard and life hit him just like any human being. And this is what happens with our parents is that we ride their waves with them. And unless we look back in time and we look at what we were believing about ourselves, about them, about the world, about our careers, unless we do that work and reflect, it's like we just carry those waves inside of us. I, I, you talk about a wave. So I'm back to you in the book talking about that. Uh, no, it was actually talking about you in therapy relating back to this incident that happened. And your therapist asked how you felt. And you said that I'm disgusting, that I don't matter, and that I'm powerless in my life. Holy smokes. Now marry that with your this event, this very, again, I'm going to call it trauma. And, and I, I'm going to use the word I'm learning to use the word trauma more because I, you know, we think about it as something just incredibly tragic, but that we all have, you know, even back to my own little money story, it came from a trauma. It wasn't anything tragic to me, but it was something yeah. that traumatized me. So you have uh, that trauma, you have this trauma uh, with your dad. And then you, in just talking about your home life, you said, I, I grew up in a house. The news is always on. I was always curious about the happenings of the world. And I'm at the dinner party, listening to my parents argue about politics with my uncles. And then you said early on, I told myself that joining the government would be a service to the world to keep people safe. Yes. And I thought, because I read that, that was actually in the book before some of these other things. And I, yeah. and I wrote there. So before even coming to this, I keep people safe from, from what? You could have a kid in that environment and come up with, you know, a hundred different variations of meaning and desire. And you took it to keep people safe. And oh think, yeah. From what? And now yes. you're, we see the threats. Yes. I mean, well, first of all, you speak about trauma. I think there's big T trauma where these, like these tragic yeah. events being hold gunpoint, being molested. And, yeah. and, you know, a lot of big T traumas do have your brain cover the information, make it foggy. you you have a chemical and biological response to, but I do think there's a lot of little T traumas because it's not just about what happens to us. Like if somebody doesn't invite you to their birthday party when you're a kid, but if you make it mean that you're a pariah and you're weird and that you're, you're, you have a hard time making friends, that's a little T trauma, not being invited to that birthday party. But yes, I mean, in, on the topic of wanting to keep people safe, you better believe that that was deeply driven by the unsafety I felt in my life. And it's sad in a way because my parents were so awesome. And, and yet this event happening to me, um, I didn't feel safe in the world. I, I hardened and, and I was like a mama bear for people. And to this day, my friends will tell me I look out for them in such a deep way. And it's because I think that that incident broke me open and, it, and, and, and I don't want to say like, there's some part of me that was broken from that, but there was definitely some part of me that busted open and was fragile for a lot of years and afraid. And even going on the playground, like my little brother, he is so sharp and such a, an incredible, he's adulting so hard right now, just bought his first home and got married. And I'm not even married yet. I mean, I'm just so proud of him. But when we were little kids, he was a slower learner. And I remember in, in elementary school, he needed to go into the resource classes for the slower learning. And I was a quick learner. I was a top student. And I remember watching some of the kids on the playground make fun of the resource students because kids are kind of brutal, you know, like bullying is so real. And I was fierce, like, don't touch my brother. Don't touch anyone in resource. And there was this little kid um, in even in elementary school named Richard and nobody would sit with him. Nobody would talk to him. I would always go over to him because I could feel other people's unsafety from my own. And because of that, I kind of felt safe with them. Like mm -hmm. I knew that they had the same fear as me. And so I would soften around them and earn their secure attachment. Cause when you can soften around someone who has anxiety, who feels unsafe, 
And if you could, if you could soften and hold their fears, you earn a secure attachment with those people. And so I think that really translated at, at a higher level of how do I make people safe? And then when I really wanted to matter in my career, it was like, I'm going to make the whole world safe because I don't feel safe. I'm going to work in counter. I'm going to catch Osama bin Laden and be the next, you know, carry in Homeland. And it, that really drove a lot of my dreams was wanting to make the world a better place and a safer place. So I'm going to ask you an off tangent question, just because of who you are and the work that you've done in this realm. It's, it's along the nature versus nurture, right? As we're looking at personality profiles and understanding ourselves, which, you know, we want to at an all time high, it seems, whether it's figuring out our genetics or our personality profile and whatnot, I am personally enamored a little bit with that aspect of kind of like where I started off at the beginning. Is this just innate you or is this something you were exposed yeah. to that when you look at this now and now, because I would say here, you've got a book, you turn and it's, you know, at face value design, you know, get unstuck, discover your direction, design your dream career. But the reason we're going on the tangent we want, we, we are now is because I got into it. I thought, no, this is, this is deeply personal. Yeah. Stuff. You're, you're still, saving people, seeking to save people, I would say it yeah. in, a, in a healthy way. But looking back again to the power of what you were exposed to, what would Ashley be doing today if those things had not happened to you? Because as I've looked at those things in my own life, there's come to a point, and this isn't a crisis thing, but it's just to me a, an intelligent question to go, I, to some degree, I don't know who I would be without those exposures. Yeah. It's hard to say, right? But I, I mean, in, in chapter two of my book, I talk about what I believe to be the 10 core skill sets that exist in the yeah. workforce so that people, I think that's the most powerful thing because the argument of my book is don't do what you love, do what you are. And, you know, I think we've been told to follow our passion and there's a big discrepancy between being good at something and being passionate about something. You know, I love to consume movies, but I don't think I would be a good producer of movies. And I I I, I, can yeah. I pull that out? Cause I love that, that just that aspect of, are you a consumer or a producer? Because I hadn't put those words to it, but I made a list a long time ago and here's all the things that I'm interested in that I like, but I don't want to do that for money. I don't want to do yeah. that for money. I don't, yeah. I love going out on trails and running and riding my bike. I care to not be, I don't care to be involved in that. I just want to do, yeah. I want to consume. I love that perspective Thank of how you, you define that. Yeah. And I, I think going to the nature versus nurture, I still think we are who we are, who we are, that when we come into the world, we do have a gift. And that's why I wrote those 10 core skill sets, because I think your, your career should still be based on where you're naturally skilled. And even though feeling a lot helped me be a more moving and inspiring writer, uh, I'm still a great writer and, and that's what my core skill set is. And that's one of the 10 core skill sets, which is words. And, you know, the reason that I love these is because when you know what your core skill set is, that's how you're spending your whole day. That's where your talents and energies are going out. And I think the number one reason people are tired in their work is because they're operating outside of their core skill set or, and this is a, another thing I write about a lot is their work is violating their core values in some way. If you believe in integrity, but you're a sales person selling something you don't believe in, that's incredibly painful. And so um, for me, the idea of nature versus nurture, I do think that excellence can happen when you commit to excellence and you can override whatever your skill sets are and create a skill set. Do I think that that's the key to fulfillment and happiness? For a very small portion of the population, yes. But for the vast, vast, vast majority, I'm thinking like 95 plus percent of people forcing your way into excellence, giving your life towards mastery, like an Olympic athlete would, or, you know, a top CEO who has committed to learning how to be a top CEO. I think that's for a lot of people, that's a recipe for exhaustion and not fulfillment. Um, even if you look at personality tests, like the Enneagram type eight is the challenger. And I don't know a lot of type eights. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of entrepreneurs are type three, they're achievers. That to me means they're achieving in an area that they already have a zone of genius. They're working in their core skill set. That's my belief about them. Um, if they're aligned and fulfilled, um, the eights, the challengers on the Enneagram, 
those are the people who are going to override whatever their skills are to master something that they need to master. And again, I think that's a very small portion of the population that will feel happiness and fulfillment by doing that. I mean, it's interesting when you look, ask me asking that question to, the, to you, let's go back to your dad. You could have had that happen, had that trauma, that, that occurrence with him and money and taken that so many different directions. And you could have gone off, I'm going to be a free bird. I'm never going to work or try to make a dime at all. I hate money and go that way. You could have gone yeah. a different way. You went the way. And even in that, to go back to you saying that I think that you think we all have a gift, uh, so you had a propensity for the perspective that you took that was probably true to who you are. So now though, as you look through the, how these perspectives patterned your life, and maybe you were trying to save people in ways that were, I don't know if it's fair to use the word unhealthy, but you weren't really. It was. Enough. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I think it showed up in my relationships. Like my partner. Now we talk about getting married and we're house hunting and I have such a great life with him. But it took a lot of trial and error because I do think life is a numbers game. That's something I write about in the book. And it's a sifting process, especially your job hunt. And and for me, I was with a lot of really smart men who needed emotional rescuing. And um, they, they weren't facing their lives. They weren't facing themselves. And they would have a lot of blocks because when you don't process trauma or you don't process your limitations, yeah. even if it's not trauma you're one of those people that are very stuck because it takes a lot of energy to push things down. You're, you, it's a full-time job. So if you're not facing the truth about something, you're talking around the thing. Um, you, you've got to put a lot of energy out to commit to staying shut off. And I found a lot of people who, because they were attracted to me, they must've wanted to open up and, and not be that way. Cause I'm so alive. I'm so open. Um, but they had a lot to face and I was clearly the rescuer. So they were good guys, but just not the right ones for me. And I had to really do a lot of healing around the part of me that wanted to rescue and save. And, you know, the most important person to rescue and save is always going to be yourself. And it took a lot of reflection for me to realize how much I needed to take all of that time I was investing in making other people's lives um, back in harmony and put that into myself and my own. You say, so rescuing, uh, saving, I mean, to a degree, again, now here you are today in a different mm -hmm. place with that thread still. But if we talk about you before you had some unhealth, now you are doing it in a healthy way. I, I just want, I, I want people to hear that, that it's not yeah. that you just deviated and found, oh my gosh, here I am. Now I'm opened up. I'm cognizant of myself. I'm aware. And life was a, a 180 degree direction you're still going in a similar direction, but yeah. in this I'm coming from a different place. And that's the go. thing. Everybody it, it's like uh, love and like look the same. If somebody's hugging you, you, you and, or so you see two people hugging, you don't know if it's love or like it's, it's, they know where they're coming from. Is it a hug because they're trying to be nice to someone they actually don't like? Is it a hug because they love them? It, it's the come from that makes something mean something. Yeah. And, and it changes how you operate and it changes how you energetically hook into things. So to this day, I've got my podcast, my book, my coaching practice, and I'm a spokesperson. There's no, there's, I don't really, I mean, it feels extreme to say there's no part of me wanting to rescue anybody, but I'm pretty good on my energy boundaries now. And I've shifted a lot of that focus because when somebody's rescuing a lot of people, it's a way to hide from yourself. You know, you're, you're too busy being with other people and tending to them than tending to your own garden. So now that I've shifted back focus on myself in, in a really good way, it's like I'm helping people from a place of empowerment and not a place of victimization. When you're, there's, there's such a big difference between being, being a victim in your life and an owner. And I, my come from when I'm working with somebody or when I'm writing my book is I want to show you how to be an owner because this is how I learned to be in my life. And as a result, nothing really happens to me. I know how much I'm in charge of creating my life and it's the good news and the bad news, right? Like sometimes I'm like, Oh, I hate this thing. I, I created it, I guess, you know? And then other times I'm like, wow, this is really amazing. And I'm so proud that I'm the creator of that. I'm the author of my life. 
even that rescuing others instead of self empowerment versus victimization that we can do kind of going back to that, we can achieve something out of wanting to prove something to somebody or out of, you know, a revenge or whatever. And, and it can be pretty powerful fuel. It's not going to end in a healthy way that you yeah. can save people out of a victimization. And it's different. Again, I, I just love that the motive is still true. I find that with the guests that I have on here, that the motives are not the motives, the direction is often somewhat on target, but we yeah. go after it for the right or wrong reasons. And we have the fallout because of that. And you are so open in the book of your own fallout. I mean, to see your, I guess, the, the other traumatic event uh, of you being at the, I don't know if I'm going to get the details right, but you're at the military, you know, base in essence, working there, go out late at night to get something to eat at the cafeteria or whatever, not having forgotten that they're on their training thing. And what was it? It was a, a it was, a, it was like a kidnap training that was kidnap happening training. on. Yeah. And they get you and, yeah. uh, and where somebody else. <laughs> yeah. But you know, somebody, if it happened to me, it would have meant something very different than mm. it happening to you because of this past and your yeah. reaction and the trajectory that that led you to, which ultimately was great. But man, mm -hmm. that was another trauma heaped on a trauma. Yeah. Yeah. I hate to even sound like, like a wounded feminist where it's like, you know, man hating or anything. Cause I definitely don't have that in my consciousness or soul at this time at all. But I do think like being taken down and kidnapped by like a group of military men, you know, with trust, you can only imagine it was a perfect storm with my oh, little trust exactly, issue collection. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, for those who read the book, I was basically kidnapped on a military base by accident. So, you know, makes for a great story. It, it, it is. And it, it, what was so healing about the book, because I didn't want to write something about myself and just think it's interesting for people to read about me. I wanted to write about me through the lens of somebody identifying with themselves. And I think we all have these rock bottom moments. What that really was for me was a rock bottom decision-making moment of yeah. realizing I've gone too far and I can't do this. And my wish for anyone is that their rock bottom doesn't have to be so low because I do think that the, the human experience is such that you have really two dynamics. There's your fear of the unknown, and then there's your misery in your current situation. And I think most people operate in a way such that they're not willing to leap into the fear of the unknown unless they are so deeply miserable in their mm -hmm. current situation that suddenly the unknown doesn't even feel scary anymore. And they're just like, screw it. I'm going to go into the unknown because I'm so miserable. Nothing can be worse than this. And I think for me, you know, I, I wanted to save the world and counterterrorism was a place that I thought I could go and keep people safe. And yet, um, it, it, there's a lot of darkness in that world as well. I mean, there has to be. Well, the line that I pulled out, which again, I just want us to hear because we miss it. We see this, we don't see the signs and, and we think that, uh, that we think the math works. One plus one must equal two. So here you are, you want to save people, you're exposed to politics, you go to counter and terror and uh, counter uh, terrorism and boom, what are you doing? You're saving people. Yeah. case closed one plus one is equals two and yet your statement is i was i was fulfilling my desire to help people and i felt empty well, boom there's a red flag right there and how many people are trying to put the math together and they see and then i know this is what gets to your all your core values in your in your your list there some of those fit some yeah. of those fit one plus one equals two i i, I wanted this i had this propensity i know that this gives me joy i know that this has truth in in me and here I am applying it in a way that, again, if you do the math, I should be good. And I'm not. What the heck is going on? And of course, it just takes a gigantic amount of more awareness, which is what you're, what you're here to do. Yeah. And well, and that's what's so interesting about careers and life is that we have these high impact moments where in these moments, we don't even realize we're making a career decision. And we don't put a mark on it. We don't flag that moment in our memory. We just make a decision and move on without knowing we did that. And then suddenly 10 years later, we're in some random career path. And if you really dig deep, it's like, why are you here? Oh, wow. It was that moment that I, you know, saw the firefighter, you know, fixing the house burning down that I realized I want to be a firefighter, but I actually am really scared of fire or I'm actually this, or I'm actually that. And so for me, that 
kidnapping moment when I was taken down and th thrown into a Hummer with a literal bag over my head. It felt like a metaphor. Like sometimes that's life. You feel like you're taken away and you have a bag over your head and it's all darkness. And for me, that was a decision-making moment, but this time I was aware of it. I was awake. I was conscious. I knew I was making a decision versus so many other times in my career. I had these moments that influenced me and I wasn't even paying attention to those moments that were influencing me. And as a result, I was living as a result of these moments versus out as a result of choice. And when I was kidnapped on the military base, and I share this in my book, that was a conscious moment of, I am accepting because that's the real work. In personal development, we will live in a world of self-improvement. And sometimes the real self-improvement is accepting, not changing, not improving upon. It's accepting who you are, where you're at, what you want, instead of saying, I need to get better at this. I need to you know, grow some thicker skin. I need to stop taking things so personally. Instead, it's, I accept that I'm a sensitive person and that's part of who I am. And I like that about myself. And this is just not going to work. Would you also say the same thing in regards to accepting something that happened, accepting that yeah. in that circumstance, just like when you were a kid, you were victimized, period, end of story. Yeah. We're not going to sugarcoat yeah. that. We're not going to. But then, as you said before, start difference. And I know this, but I don't think, I, mean, I know people have heard this, but I don't think we actually ingest it, that you were victimized. You did not continue on being a victim. So you're accepting yeah. that victimization. And, and so when you said that things that we didn't need to accept, that has been significant for me too. Actually. Yeah. That, accepting that, oh, I'm, I'm not limitless. There, there actually are some limits. I am, I am human. My wife says that over and over, honey, when I lament about something, it's, you're human and just accepting that how much yeah. do you get caught up in. So I love that perspective. I love what you're saying there too, because I, I feel like I've been on this quest and, you know, like you were saying with my book, it's a deep dive and I've gotten, I've heard from a couple people who said that they were suicidal and that the book pulled them out. And I think that these questions of purpose and meaning sometimes saturate us so deeply that we forget how human we are and we have to remember, especially if you're personal development oriented, no matter how much you grow, no matter how much you try to self-actualize, no matter how much purpose you have, you're a human being. And we are down here on this earth and we are doing the best we can. And if we knew better, we would do better only every time. We're always operating at the level of thinking we're operating at. And, and that's why I don't have any regrets. Like I'm so proud of, of everything. And and of where I'm going, because I know that I'm folding these moments into who I'm becoming and I'm treating my career and my life as an experiment. And I think, you know, having all of these experiences that we're talking about and being so human, I realize like, you know, the, the equivalent of what we're doing right now to people is like socially saying the first person you have a crush on marry them. That's what we're doing in our career. The first job you get, you better grow it. And it's like, you know what? You're so human and you find yourself through experiments and your career is no different. And so I've really learned to hold my career lightly, to not overthink it. I know that there's a lot of perfectionism out there. And one thing I talk about is what a mask that can be for fear of failure. You know, you just want to be perfect so that nobody finds anything wrong with you and you don't have to feel that failure feeling. But Ultimately, I think life is an experiment and the sooner you can give yourself permission to be experimental, the sooner you can self-actualize, love your career, give yourself permission to say that something's not working for you and, and try something new on and, and be courageous in doing that. That was like a, a profound ending clip, but I can't end there, but I have to yeah. pull that one out. Thank you. Uh, you know, when you look at, we're sitting here talking, I think it's clear of the thread of your motives. I want you for the sake of those listening to explain, because on the career tangent, explain what you've chosen as you describe yourself, primarily, at least in the book as a career coach. Now you just gave yeah. us a list of, you know, you do a lot of things now, now you're an author and a speaker and a spokesman and, and, and all these things. But if we look at that as a career coach, because you just said, so here's this book, 
Don't hold up for those who watch the video again. My yellow sunbeam. Yeah. Yellow sunbeam. You turn. Why? Oh, you turn. Again, the tagline is get unstuck, discover your direction, design your dream career. So you're likely to see this at the end cap at the bookstore or, or whatnot and the career section or whatever. And yet you just said, and you've had multiple people read the book and say that they were considering suicide and the book was a, a, a saving grace uh, for them. To take your desire to help serve, save people, uh, and you did choose to do it, you're doing it. I, I was about to say under the guise, that's not fair because it's not a facade, it's, it's true to you, but you're doing it as a career coach. You're doing it with, here's a book, talking yeah. about career, and yet you're here on the Motive Show because as I got reading into it, I, I want to go a lot deeper. It's a lot deeper than a career. It yeah. is. Well, our careers are very deep. It's a, our worthiness okay. is tied into them. Okay. Our, our time. I mean, we spend 90,000 hours of our waking lives at work. That's one, you know, that's two thirds of our waking time on this planet, you know, and, and everyone wants to make it count. No one wants to sit and look at a clock and wait until five and get the Sunday scaries on the weekend and be in this hamster wheel. Everybody wants it to mean something. So yeah. Our careers are highly emotional, highly based on our life, what we believe about success, what we think is possible for us. And it dictates all of the time we spend in the day, which ultimately becomes our life. And so I think to write a career book is to write a book about life and to write a book about who you are. And, you know, I, I just got tired over the years of watching so many people who are in so much pain and confused because they thought, you know, I love sports, so I'm going to be a sports agent, or I love movies, so I'm going to be a film director or an actress, or I love fashion, so I'm going to be a designer. There's such a disconnect between who you are and what you like. And I just really wanted to spell it out for people to take them out of pain and and to give them that clarity. And that's what I certainly hope happens for the readers. Well, you obviously are And the mess. I think you put this line, it might have been just in the information that we gathered from you up front. You said, my main message is do not do, and you said this in the show, do not do what you love or follow your passion. Instead, do what you are. Mm -hmm. This means learning your skill set and how to express your natural gifts in the world. And I'm going to say this takes massive awareness because when you say that, instead, do what you are, with all due grace, we're at a time in life. You talked about the increase in depression right now. And I refer yeah. so often to that's the highest uh, illness that we have or, or the yeah. fastest growing is diseases of despair and it's yeah. depression and suicide. We do not know who we are. And so I think even the follow what you love, follow your passion is going even more awry because we have even less of that, much less knowing who they are. So again, I'm going to caveat that with what you said. This means learning your skill set and how to express your natural gifts in the world. That's the story of your book and that you went through is figuring out who, who you are. Again, yeah. there are threads, but that you were doing them in ways that did not produce the help and, and fulfillment. Yeah. Well, and I, I believe that who we are moves, who we are shifts. And as, like I was saying, like, as you believe something new, this old version of you dies and you see the world through new lenses. And yet I do think we all come into the planet with some part of us that's untouched and that really stays intact throughout our lives, the core of our being. And that's why you see the word core in my book many times, core skill set, core value, core interest, core motivator. These concepts are throughout because I want to bring people home. And that's the concept of making a U-turn. It's instead of, and, and a lot of us are pendulums, you know, we swing all the way right or all the way left. Like it's like the girl who was dating the guy in the band and he was traveling all the time. And then he, and then she dates the guy who is so stable and like working in at home and never leaves the house. Like it, we are all kind of in reactivity sometimes. And I, I really wanted to ground people into who they are. And the truth is sometimes a lot of the time, you're just a couple millimeters away from the right choice. And there's just something off. Maybe it's where you work. You know, I think what you do, your, your job title, your responsibilities, your energy, you're putting out your skill set is very different from how you do it. And there's, those are the two dynamics I think exist in a, in a good career, what you do, your core skill set, you should be spending a lot of your day doing that, but how you do it, given that we know 50% of people leave their job because they don't like their boss. What we can know for sure is that how your job looks 
matters just as much as what your job is. And I think the how is a lot of self excavation. What do you value? What do you care about? Does it matter what your environment is? Does it matter who you're working with? Or are you somebody that could put your head down and for the love of the work itself, it doesn't really matter. I mean, there's just so many pieces to put in place for that for people. Well, I found in your, in you, in this book to begin with, and now in you, it's, it's masterful. Uh, the, Thank the, you. Um, your guidance was masterful and beautiful in its vulnerability. And that's why I wanted to have you here. Thank you for doing what you have done. I will be, I, I've got some pieces on it. I want to study that as I talked about, I want to come back and I think go deeper on a couple things, a couple topics with you. Uh, in the show, but just grateful that we've gotten to connect, grateful that I got to benefit from your story and your message, and so honored to bring it to the audience, Ashley. Thank you so much for having me and for everybody who's listening.